Great, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Taking the Lead, District Models for Identifying What Works session. I hope everybody is enjoying sunny San Diego. And no, it is the last day of what has been an incredible three days of sessions. So I know all of you are like getting overstimulated by all the information, but I promise you that for the next 50 minutes, we have another fascinating conversation ahead of us. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, we are together today, two teams, um, uh, research, uh, research and districts teams together who are going to share a lot with us about what works. Um, so to the beginning, um, so what I will do is, you know, you can read everyone's bio um, on, the, on the app, but uh, beginning on my left, we have Matt Doyle and Shauna Cohen um, from the Vista Unified School District and UCSD. And then for down there, we have Kristen Hallegren and Michael Lamont from Mathematica and Atlanta Public Schools. And these two peers have been working closely together, exemplifying some of the best practices of how universities work directly with practitioners and how is that really translated into effective implementation in school districts. So very excited to do that. Um, so to just kick it off a little bit, maybe Shauna and Matt, um, you know, this Unified School District and UCSD have actually been collaborating on many projects mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit more at a high level, the breadth of your collaboration, and how do you guys work together continuously to ensure that the educator's voice right. is incorporated into the research in an effective manner? Sure, thanks, thanks Nancy. Um, I'll start. So we started our partnership more than five years ago, and we act interestingly started it with Dr. Alan Daly focusing on how we expand social networks of teachers and administrators. So what we find oftentimes is, as you probably heard, teachers like to live in their classroom, kind of a, a quasi-silo. So focusing on social network theory and how we can expand networks for, so teachers are collaborating, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, and then uh, administrator collaboration. So we started with social networks, and from there our partnership expanded to actually bringing researchers into our school district in real time and working hand-in-hand -hand with teachers, in particular teachers in the early education phase. What we're finding is that our prenatal to grade three area of focus is having the greatest impact on, on closing that achievement gap. So we're, we have a, a particular focus in that area. And um, our focus right now with our research practice partnership to the International Center for Educational Research and Practice is to bring researchers like Shauna and others in um, to conversations with teachers in a think tank environment to talk about pedagogy. And what we know with research is oftentimes research gets to teachers two to three to five to ten years late. And oftentimes there's new research that they've done when they finally start reading the research. And so this idea of how can we bring researchers and teachers together so that the teachers can influence researchers thinking about what is the essential question that they're researching and that how can those researchers impact teachers real time about how they can adjust their practice real time. Yeah, so I have three words to define the collaboration that we, ha we have going on here. The first is relationships. So we're building really strong relationships between researchers and educators. And we're really trying to break down these traditionally siloed disciplines also, like the different, like brain science and education research to make meaningful connections that will actually transform traditional educational practices. The second word is ed equity slash inclusion. Just pretend those are one word. <laughs> We're focused on this notion of inclusivity and equity. So our work asks real world questions about how can we lift students, children, to be the best they can be, to reach their potential. And we're also inclusive. We want all stakeholders at the table sitting with us to provide input in the research design process, asking co-creating research questions and implementing the research. And then third, this idea of co-construction. So we've adopted a, a learning orientation and we believe that we have a lot to learn from all the stakeholders involved. And so we engage with those stakeholders in this co-construction of research studies. So teachers, administrators, education researchers, brain scientists, we all co-design these research studies. We co-construct the research questions. We interpret the findings in this iterative fashion in order to, to kind of continuously improve our practices. Um, I just flew in from New York last night. Uh, I was at the, uh, AERA conference, I don't know if you guys, as educators, some of you might know about it. 
Um, and while I was there, I engaged in several discussions with high, you know, high, highly influential education researchers. We were all talking about why aren't we seeing the results of educational research in classrooms, like in real time classrooms. And I think that a lot of the reason is because we're always siloed in these traditional <coughs> disciplinary kind of spaces and we aren't breaking down those barriers and actually communicating with each other and engaging and designing these research studies together. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're kind of to, trying to flip the, these traditional notions of education sp separated with, you know, from research and we're trying to kind of co-create and co-design these studies together. So, yeah. Great, thanks so much for sharing that. So moving across the country a little bit, in Atlanta Public Schools, uh, Mathematica has been working together on a three-year evaluation and formative study, and I know you guys are about midway through now. Tell us a little bit about how the project initiated, the goals of the project, and how the school district is already at using the, some of those early findings of it. Yep, absolutely. So when our current administration under Dr. Karstarfin came in, we were, like many urban school districts, we had a subset of schools that were chronically underperforming our students. And so our administration took a big bet on how do we turn around those schools. And so we launched a massive turnaround effort to really help those students. But when you make a big bet like that, where we put tens of millions of dollars into these schools, the question is asked, like, is it effective? Um, and so that, um, with incredibly generous funding from the Walton Family Foundation, we were able to solicit uh, Mathematica to come in and partner with us to evaluate this. So over the next three years, we're learning how is our turnaround effort, how is it working, where do we need to improve? Um, and it is it has already borne incredible fruits of how we've been able, you know, we're at a tech conference, all those uh, stereotypical words like fail forward, be agile, we've already been able to take some of, you know, the interim results and change what we're doing to better serve kids. I can let Kristen kind of talk about that. Yeah, sure. So we. Uh, Mathematica bid to do this evaluation, and um, when we were awarded the contract, we worked with APS to make sure that the plan that we designed um, was created and, um, and answered the questions the way that APS, so that it would get the information that you wanted to know. Um, the way that we designed that, it is a three-year project, so when you talk about getting educators back what they need. Sometimes it does take time. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have a series of reports. Um, we've done one and we're in the process of our second year report. And each, each of kind of the interim reports are designed to really investigate one aspect of the turnaround strategy. There's a number of things going on in these schools and supports for the schools. So we've kind of honed in on um, trying to understand what's happening with um, a, a few of those pieces. Um, and we can, you know, <coughs> go into detail about that. But the idea is that we're honing in on a few pieces each year, and then in the final year, we'll be able to really, um, you know, look at the entire strategy and look at the, how the um, students in the turnaround schools that have received the funding are doing compared with students in schools like those um, in the district and also in the state of Georgia um, to really see what differences have been, um, have been detected as a result of this. Great, you know, and that really springs up, you know, the point that lots of research happened, but then how does that actually translate into decision making? So, you know, the work that Shauna and Kristen do, like if we can talk about how, um, maybe from the district perspective, how you guys actually boil down you know, the complex findings into decisions that can be digested by the stakeholders and the people who need to implement changes. Well, from a district perspective, I can tell you that the way we designed the research practice partnership was that we have a cabinet level lead. I'm, I'm the assistant superintendent, so I'm with working with researchers. And then we have um, elements of all of our leadership on our teams that work. Um, principals, um, directors, and then teachers at the level. So we're actually embedded in the work, and the work is part of our district strategic plan. So not only do we have a partnership, but we develop this district strategic plan that actually puts at the top of the list relationships with our research practice partnership and then creates space for funding that goes along with that. We're also, when we co-design, you know, together, we are kind of iteratively, iteratively always kind of communicating and trying to make 
better our communication between teachers and educators and between you know, brain scientists and uh, education researchers. So it's like we're always trying to understand each other and talk and communicate in simple ways so that we can all kind of be on the same page. So it's a constant challenge, but I think it, it, we always learn from each other at every interaction. And especially given the three-year process for what's happening in Atlanta, tell us a little bit about how these like interim results um, get implemented. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we decided to look at first, and it was a great collaboration of what do we think? You know, when you think about a turnaround effort, you have to be thinking about multiple years before you are able to make solid summative claims. And and so we looked at part of parts of our strategy where we thought we could get interim results that were meaningful. And so we looked at our high impact tutoring the first year. And so looking at those results, you can, you know, when you get those results back, usually it's in number of standard deviations above the mean, right? And, but then what does that mean for our cabinet, right? For our superintendent, how many, and then you translate it to something that's meaningful. How many extra months of learning may or may not have happened? Um, and then in this case, it was, you know, we looked at all the research when we were designing our turnaround and you look at what Fryer did in Houston and stuff and we thought, oh yes, this is gonna be great. And we get the results back and actually we had no effects in the first year from our high impact tutoring. And that's like a difficult pill to swallow. Um, but the reality was, you know, that's what we did. And so we went and we talked to our board and we talked to our superintendent and then we pivoted and we said, okay, um, we're not gonna do that anymore. And thankfully, you know, our partners were willing to change how we evaluate because now we're gonna change. And, gave our principals choice of how they wanted to use those dollars instead to implement something that was more effective. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's always a big takeaway, but there's a lot of details in that and who you share the details mm. with and the conversations that you have about that, you have to be very thoughtful. Um, you know, there are people with time and then there are people <laughs> with very little time. And um, as you know, it is a partnership. I think, Shauna, you, you, that's a really important point that who you're communicating with and what you're saying and what you're making clear mm -hmm. and the caveats or anything that um, you think is important, um, your audience is always important. And um, thinking about that from the researcher perspective is something that I know I'm always doing. Um, because, it, you know, there are lots of technicalities that go into what you design and how you mm -hmm. selected your control group and how, you know, all these things. Um, but in the end, what someone wants to know is, why didn't that work? So you also have to build into your study, um, you know, looking at the number of hours mm -hmm. that kids spent doing the tutoring or looking at um, what it was that the teachers were talking with the tutors about or whatever it is. Um, and so you have to begin your study thinking about what will be important for these, for this yes. district to know um, so that they really can make those decisions. And I think that's a really critical part of any sort of study that you're gonna do in schools. Right. And that's what I feel, I think it's really interesting and cool about this work that we're doing is like, we're asking the teachers real time, like what is it that you wanna know? What are you curious about with regards to your students? Like, you know, what, what <coughs> questions do you have about learning and how kids learn? And then we're using those questions to build the studies. Right, so this concept of, I mean, certainly this sounds like really interesting, but going on the topic of time, let's talk about time investment. This seems that you know, the more interesting it is and the more complex it is, it requires resources and time from the educators, from the researchers. So given particularly you know, how time-strapped teachers are, um, how do you actually, what are the trade-offs that, that need to happen to enable teachers to effectively participate in research practice partnerships? And what, how do you guys approach this? Um, and what are some strategies that have been effective to enable you guys to really take your research practice partnerships forward? Well, I can start with that from a time element, from a district perspective. I think that the only way to, to ensure that there's enough time for this to be successful is to make it a priority for the district. So I think the, the time thing is addressed by it being a number one priority. So in our district, it's, it's the number one priority. We have seven in our strategic plan. And so identifying the need to close the achievement gap, close the gap before it actually opens in the earliest grade levels is a huge priority for our school board and our community. And as a result of that, we weed out um, projects and things that, uh, as was pointed out by Michael, don't necessarily lead to effective results. So um, making tough, tough decisions about what's important and what's not, 
uh, and then creating some space for these teachers to actually get together with researchers and spend time. So we've been able to clear the table on professional developments in other areas so that we create our, um, space for educators, both after school and during school, to meet with some of the researchers. One, one last thing about that was, in addition to putting it as strategy number one, it's, it's a an, 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 an very important part of our focus. We also have aligned a significant amount of funding, not just mm -hmm. through research practice, but also with our school district. Right. Michael, what about you guys? Yeah, I think about, um, and some of my principals are sitting in the audience, yeah. and so I, I want our principals to be great school leaders and not have to like coordinate logistics with uh -huh. researchers, right? Uh -huh. And so our office and Kristen, we work collaboratively to be as, light touch with principals and their school staff as possible. So, you know, we take on a lot of that administrative burden of scheduling and making sure that, you know, when the research team comes in, it's smooth um, so that we are not taking a lot of time of our principals, of our coaches, of district leaders as well. But then we can still get really, really robust interviews and, and implementation data of what's actually going on um, in the schools. So the questions that you ask mm. need to have a point. Uh -huh. um, the, what you're going to do with that information needs to be clear ahead of time. Um, and I also, I mean, Atlanta has done a really good, smart thing <laughs> by having a third party come in and uh -huh. evaluate this effort. Because no matter what the results are going to be in the end, they did it right. They, they asked for an answer that was done, that's going to be given to them using the, the strongest methods that we can, can come up with. So that makes it really um, easy to talk with principals and teachers and coaches and support service staff, all the people we talk with, we can say what we want to do with this is valuable for you and for building what you're trying to do. That's our goal. Our, our goal as researchers is to make the decision, the evidence available to you f for decision making better. So that's, in my mind, that's how to use people's time effectively. And that sounds like a really effective partnership that you guys have going there in Atlanta. Now, Sean, there's multiple projects going on at UCSD yeah. with, with VISTA, <laughs> and given your experience over multiple projects, were there lessons learned about ways that time can more effectively used um, that you can also share? Yeah, um, so we have like 13? Yeah, 13 different 13 projects. 13 different projects. And I think some do this whole co-creation and partnership a little bit differently. Um, I, there's one project that I kind of want to talk a little sure. bit more in detail about. Um, so f this project is the EdNeuro project. And we have, as I was talking about er earlier, we have cognitive science scientists, neuroscientists, education researchers that, that educate, like that talk about systems level work, and then we have like developmental psych kinds of people. And all of us as researchers are kind of teamed up together to work with administrators, teachers, special ed teachers, preschool teachers, K, K through 12 teachers, all, all kinds of different teachers. And we have this kind of uh, sacred time once a month where we get together mm -hmm. and we kind of talk to each other and brainstorm about what are the, and we're just at the beginning, you know, what are the things that you're really interested in figuring out? How, do, how does your child learn? How do kids in your classroom learn? And so we're at the beginning stages and what I love about it is that it's not just like, you know, we want kids to be better spellers or, you know, focused on the outcomes. It's really trying to understand and map and document the process of this collaboration. And so, uh, although we're just right at the beginning, I'm thinking and hoping that um, this kind of tr change from the tradition is going to be some, some product will come from it and the process of learning from it will be, um, I think, really fruitful for everybody involved. Um, there are other projects that kind of where the researcher comes in, takes data, and leaves, but I think this project that we're talking about is much more collaborative and much more um, kind of co-create, we co-create together. So it really seems like you know, some of the key words I'm hearing here are like collaboration, co-creating, 
And given your success uh, for relationships together, if you were to give advice to districts um, and researchers on how do you establish a research partnership from the beginning so that's successful, what were some of the lessons learned or advice? It could have been from this particular project working together with each other or from prior projects, or maybe there were um, relationships from bids that you guys declined um, in it. But what advice would you give um, as people consider setting up something similar to what you guys are doing? I mean, I would say if you're going to make big investments for your kids, be willing to ask tough questions and have someone answer them. Um, we placed a huge bet on our school turnaround, and so we wanted the very best to come in and help us understand. You know, you hear a lot of what are the impacts of these ed tech companies? What are the impacts of these turnaround you know, strategies that we're doing? Find a partner that you trust and is you know above reproach to give those answers to you. Um, that would that's definitely my advice. Even if it's bad news. Even if it's bad news, because <laughs> you're, our kids are worth it, right? I want Especially to know if, if this news. is working. I don't want somebody to just sugarcoat it and give it back to me, because if it's not working, it is imperative that we change and pivot to do better. So how did you know that Kristen would be willing to give you bad news? <laughs> um, I, I mean, the reputation of Mathematica, honestly. You know, between Kristen and Brian Gildy, the co-PI, like those those people, their professional reputations are you know, the gold standard in education policy research, and that's a big reason. They, they have a track record of going in and good, bad, or ugly, giving the honest truth, and, and that is so appealing um, from, from my seat. Well, and I think, you know, that is why we, we spend time talking with people. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot of this conference about big data, and it's really important, and the numbers say a lot, but people also right. say a lot, and, um, and it's understanding the implementation. So if you do have to deliver bad news, it's actually not. It's helpful news. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. evidence for something that our kids deserve, right? I really yep. like that you, how you put that. Um, so, and I do think that if you are a district looking for a researcher, one of the one of the key criteria that, um, like as a researcher, we strive to offer is the strongest design so that you get the best evidence, yes. right? And yes. um, and even if that means that what you might get does have to cause you to pivot. So maybe talk about that pivot a little bit. I mean, it could be the Vista team or the Lanta team. Like from your research together, what pivots have happened? Some examples. I, I can say that the, maybe the greatest pivot that has happened is that um, our educators are doing uh, more listening than talking. Um, typically, educators, you know, have the idea. Right? They have the, they have the answer, and they want to create the lesson plans and engage people. So I think a pivot for us is that I've watched our, our teachers really engage in meaningful conversations about what is neuroscience, what is cognitive science. They're, they're kind of intrigued by the whole concept of brain science and how that can influence their thinking about being better teachers. So the pivot is, a, is away from getting uh, the results of a study and uh, toward this idea of how it impacts their thinking about their teaching. I think one big pivot that we've had as researchers is that we're also listening a lot more too. Yeah. And we're, we're trying to kind of make sure that we are capturing all of the perspectives at the table. I think another pivot is that we are, what's the word? I'm trying to think of the word. Um, we're, not, we're not focused on our agenda. Kind of, we're, we're more trying to understand what is it that everybody else Authentic. who's contacting, who has more contact with students, what do they, what are their needs so that we can better help them better implement educational strategies. So. I, I, I like how you're talking about researchers really taking into account the, the policy context and the things going on for those who are um, engaging in the research. I, I would say that that's probably the biggest pivot point. Um, you know, for Atlanta, I think, you know, our first year, what one of the things that we really wanted to be able to talk with the district about and learn about was how the district, um, how the district systems and structures are set up to support the schools that are in, um, you know, in the turnaround you know, strategy. So one of the things that we provided them with early um, information on was just what did we hear from reports of district officials about, um, you know, the feedback they're giving, that continuous improvement um, cycle. We learned about how they're leading each of the strategies that they're implementing. 
Um, and we were able to sort of give like a red light, yellow light, green light um, coding of that information to help give them um, some feedback about that. And then what we did is we said, well, we don't have, our project plan didn't, doesn't say, let's look into all of this. So we right. said, so what, what areas do you want us to dig into more? What can we um, continue and, and, and really kind of like dig our hands into why this answer was what it was or what's going on here? Um, and then they report, told us what they wanted mm -hmm. to know. And that was a little bit of a pivot point because it ended up being there wasn't a lot of the district um, structures that, that they were all in pretty good shape, right? So they said, you know, one thing we really do want to know about is this high impact tutoring. And so what, and um, as well, they, uh, Atlanta has a partnership school model where they have two school, they, in the first year they had um, one school that had just undertaken, it was turned over to a charter management organization, it was in a, doing a really new, different thing, and, and they said, we want to understand everything about what that school looks like this year, so spend your resources there. So it was a little bit of like, okay, our plan had been this, but let's go here, and we had the data, um, so we, we could pivot that way. Yep. That's, so I mean, along the pivots, you know, there, there's always the good, bad, and the ugly that comes along um, in any research, in any relationship, and partnerships. So. Tell me a little bit about you know some of the tensions that might have kind of occurred. You know, it may be either between the the district and the research, or maybe even just kind of tension you're sensing from the actual practitioners, the leaders at the school. Um, you know, over a course of a long research partnership, and how do you take that feedback that comes directly from the educators, and how do you kind of make that into a positive to feed into the pivot decisions? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a really good example. I think everyone in this room can resonate with it. It's data privacy. Um, so that's a tension, that's a real tension, especially when we're talking about neurological um, conversations and students' cognitive growth and how we're measuring it real time using new technology that UCSD is creating to track neurological growth. So su super huge challenge, we knew it from the beginning and so we're creating space for parents and teachers to get that out, that conversation going up front so that when we get into this um, implementation aspect of it, um, parents feel like they're part of the discussion and they feel like they own that, the model that we're creating and that we're maintaining the privacy of their, of their student data while at the same time uh, creating an opportunity for students to get better at learning. So I would say David, data privacy is a big one. I think also a big tension is timeline. We, um, or as researchers, I feel like we always want to just kind of go and get the research and just forget about the like rapport building and the relationship building. But <laughs> I've learned that that is such an essential part yes, of this whole process that the timeline will just have to be adjusted. And that part doesn't really matter because it's this process oriented yeah kind of approach that I think, that I, I just as personally as my, in my own research, like have learned that it's really about the process rather than kind of getting that, you know, significant finding or whatever. Yeah. Kristen, would you agree that from your process or would you feel like that that's a different from what you've seen? No, I, I, I agree. Um, I was gonna say I had two sort of areas of tension. Mm -hmm. One is that as the researcher speaking with someone at a school, there's always a tension about who you represent. You know, and I, you know, this is why it, I think it's really important to have a third party come in and be able to represent, no, represent just excellent mm -hmm. research, right? Yep. Um, but you're still speaking with a principal who's very invested in their school and their students, and sometimes what the district is doing is not helpful to them <laughs> because yep. there's a lot going on and they have, Things are managing, and, and you're sitting here, you're listening, and you're you're knowing that eventually you're going to have to to figure out a way to report mm -hmm. <laughs> to someone who's asked you to tell them about what people are saying. And you have to kind of figure out a way to <coughs> say what's important and say it productively. Um, the other tension is that every report you ever write will not include something somebody wanted to know, <laughs> and that's you just have to like surrender to that. Um, but you can manage it by being very clear as you go in the process, and this is where we get back to process. You, you ask the questions about who, who is the ultimate audience that you want out of this? What is it that, that is important? Um, and you can plan ahead to really make sure that 
to make, you can minimize, like you get to the end and somebody's like, we knew that. That's like the worst <laughs> possible yeah. thing. So understanding your audience sounds like a big one. Yeah. So Matt and Michael, like, how do you define that audience and like making sure that, you know, oftentimes in a, in a community, there are multiple stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Like how do you prioritize mm -hmm. and how do you think about what the right audience is so that Shauna and Kristen are writing this towards that right audience? I, th I think you're very deliberative about, okay, you know, when we see drafts, who are we socializing them with? When we're getting ready to roll them out, who, which cabinet members are at the table when we think about board presentations? having that being very deliberative about as you roll out who's going to see what when so that you know hey could we look at you know the comparison group can we add you know something about that we do it early and up front as opposed to at the back end where then it is kind of too late so that you know people understand um, because there is is it internal stakeholders is it our even our cmo partners right because we're bringing in an external partner to to validate what a cmo partner is doing so how do we bring them into the fold, what is the appropriate time for them to understand you know, what we're saying? So I think um, I would definitely agree that managing those expectations is very, yeah. very important. I, I would add that the audience, that's a really good question about audience. So the, my answer to you would be, you have to consider all of the audiences. Um, and you have to be very deliberate about how you consider all the audiences and when those audiences are onboarded. Um, you know, I, I think of you know, this idea of change management, you know, use the group to change the group. So the group becomes the audience, but there's also the, uh, the people who are doing the work. So we, we were, were very deliberate when we created the International Center for Educational Research and Practice to be mindful of the parent audience and the community audience and what role that they have to play in this. And are we continuing those lines of communication? Data privacy is an example. But the, the, the superintendent and the school board and the audience of addressing that audience through the development of strategy one in our strategic plan mm -hmm. and, and making sure that this work that we're engaged in is addressing an intractable problem in our community and how are we addressing that. And then the researchers are an audience for us. So we're addressing them not only as an audience but as practitioners and, and partners in it. And then teachers, most importantly, are, are, are engaging in meaningful ways, doing the work, but also receiving information and growing from that information. So I think we've been deliberate about addressing all of the audiences and being willing to have some room within the structure of ISERP at the International Center to make adjustments as it goes along. This is a messy work, and so we need to think about creating space to, to make course adjustments and pivot at when it's necessary. And also thinking about your point about um, your, the way that you communicate with your stakeholders, I feel like there needs to be kind of constant communication or peer, at least periodic, you know, when developing reports and things like that. It's not just like do the, do the work and then submit this final report, but there's constant communication about what you're expecting, what the audience is expecting and what you're actually doing and making sure that there's match, or that there's, you know, constant matching going on there. And it's a language that you mm. have to know how to speak. Yes. Um, there's researcher language and there's <laughs> not researcher language. And um, more often than not, researchers are very bad about um, their language. <laughs> and I think it's, it's really important that instead of saying something like a standard deviation, you need to say, well, this, this is about this many weeks of mm -hmm. reading instruction or, you know, what does it mean to, um, what, what did your findings really mean? And being able to um, comfortably and confidently communicate those is just like critical. So thinking about language and making things accessible, given how exciting things are happening in Atlanta and Vista, thinking about your research not just touching upon the lives in those two communities, how do you propose kind of your research practice partnership getting this out so that more districts and researchers can learn from the process and the findings and right. be able to kind of infect changes that you know, may be generalized but can be also applicable to environments besides the communities where the research is connect conducted. Like, how have you guys thought about that? Yeah, it's so scale up. Um, so we did. So when we developed ISERP, the International Center, we actually created a website, iserpglobal.com. Um, and we designed it for that purpose. So to be like the archive, the ongoing narrative with the larger global community about this um, you know, research practice partnership, in particular in the area, in the area of um, cognitive science, neuroscience and cognitive science, and how it influenced the, the support for students as they're learning um, literacy or language or numeracy. So iserp.global.com um, 
is our kind of running narrative of how these projects are growing. And we'll, we're, we'll be adding to that website as we learn and, and um, have different uh, findings to go along with that. But we've also included on the website narratives, videos, where there's kind of conversations. That qualitative aspect of this partnership is as important as the outcomes of it. So we've done a number of things on this, on this website, but the intent was to speak to a larger audience, the international audience. I think also we're trying, we're capturing this process. Like we're, we're like taking data every time we meet and capturing the process of engagement with teachers and all at these teacher think tank meetings, you know, we're, so, so that we can kind of describe how we came about, how we developed the process and mm -hmm. the challenges and the affordances of the process. And then we're going to include that in a kind of a, to our audiences in the reports or in the publishable papers that we, we take from this. Um, I, I think a big takeaway is that these three words that I keep going back to, relationships, equity, and co-construction. If we can kind of develop research practice partnerships that really focus on those big concepts, I feel like the, you know, the outcomes and the replicability is, you know, is possible. So in almost every session I have sat in, I hear, if there are funders out there, <laughs> so if there are funders out there, here's my idea. I, I mean, you know, literature reviews are kind of what researchers do. And they're also a great way to disseminate quickly information that educators need. And they are not hard mm -hmm. for people who mm -hmm. do this for a living to do. And I think that it's a very, um, basic, easy way um, to help infuse, help connect districts um, with researchers and evaluators who want to be able, I mean, districts want to know what's good and what's working and what best uh -huh. practices are. Researchers have that information and can get it very quickly and can synthesize it very quickly. And it seems to me that that's a really nice, easy starting point to just do like a landscape review uh -huh. on something you want to know about. Right, it is out there, and um, time, as we've discussed, is limited for educators. So delegate that, pay for someone else to do it who knows how to do it, and mm -hmm. and I think that's a really great way to, to get going and, and and make products with it that are cool. Mm -hmm. Right, I, and I've seen like really cool stuff here, and cool isn't always like in the educator space <laughs> because of no time. Right, so make that you can like put resources to that. And I think that would be a really innovative, it's basic, but cool thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've, we've done that, you know, a lit review of something for our chief HR officer about compensation study and education research, right? Like something in, that would take her team, you know, hours and weeks to do that we outsource to experts who can give us that quickly. Um, I think specifically with this relationship, I, I think about so many districts have turnaround efforts, turn, you know, that's, that's super big in our space. And I'm super excited to share as we go along um, our interim results and our, our summative results at the end because I think you know, the field, other districts have a lot that, that we can teach and learn uh, about our turnaround effort. Um, and so I, I'm excited as this, this goes on to share that with the, with the field. You know, I, I think that getting districts together mm -hmm. to talk yeah. about what they're doing. I mean, you know, Mathematica, I, I know we have at least three districts that we work out where we're studying their turnaround efforts, right? But do those districts all know? I mean, Mathematica can bring them together, but there are, you know, the extent to which and districts can come together and have time and space to do what we're doing here is, you know. So it's not just the researcher in the districts, but the districts themselves mm -hmm. right. also would be a great learning opportunity. So given all of that, let's talk about the future. Um, you, know, you know, you guys are just the beginning of the exemplars of what we hope to see in this industry, but what do you think effective research practice partnership will look like in the future and in terms of what resources or changes do you think are needed to enable kind of the best version of what you guys do to happen at scale across the country? And so in that sense, if you had one magical wish um, to propel this work forward, what would that be? Um, any order, you guys can start. One magical wish. I mean, uh, I, 
unlimited funding to engage in designing meaningful research designs before we implement big things, right? If, if I could sit with Kristen and Brian to implement a, a randomized control trial about rolling out some ed tech thing to, so that at the end I will be able to actually make summative claims. Mm -hmm. So many of the sessions we've heard about is what's the evidence and, and people honestly haven't, I haven't heard lots of great claims, mm -hmm. right? When you think about the measurement or you think about the tools, they're, they're not there because, mm -hmm. you know, actually experimental or quasi-experimental research design just isn't being implemented as you roll out these products. And so for me, I'm incredibly skeptical uh, without that. So my wish would be to have the resources to do that for all of our district's major initiatives. Yeah. I Go ahead. I'm Go ahead. gonna piggyback on that because sure. it, uh, so um, my wish is that um, the data of the data on not just the students who are doing the intervention, but the ones yes. who aren't, yes. needs to be available and accessible. Yes. So many times districts come and they want to talk um, about how can we evaluate this intervention, and the first thing that we mm -hmm. ask is, well, let's talk about where we get the data on the control group. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you right. want to know. It's easy to know how well a principal is engaging with a particular kind of intervention or how well teachers are engaging with something, but what about those that aren't? When mm -hmm. you go to create a control group, you have to know what they're doing so you can make that comparison, right? And that is the expensive big lift. So, and I think Atlanta has started doing this. They're in this collaborative mm -hmm. with a number of districts where they have, have all said, we will share our data, yep. um, de-identified, obviously, um, and, and that is like a researcher's dream because mm -hmm. it is really difficult to build strong comparison groups because you have to go get someone's buy-in to say, hey, you know, can we use your de-identified data for nothing, for kids that aren't getting what, what we are actually studying? And that's like a major obstacle. So my dream is like that kind of data. So I would add a wish, a simple wish and a complex wish, but just, just briefly. The simple wish is that our partnership um, is not interrupted. In the education world, um, almost always some kind of a change in leadership interrupts uh, the, the budding of a partnership. So I think it's a simple wish, but a good wish. A complex wish is that there's intersectionality um, globally. So this idea of the, this, this relationship of building a partnership, not just with the University of California, San Diego, but with the Gulf University of Kuwait, my good friend Jerry Burton, and how can we have conversations on a global context about what ed neuro neurological scientific discoveries and you know, prenatal to grade three continuum um, programs can do, not only for VISTA in San Diego, but for Kuwait um, or for Africa. And so when we think about this intersectionality of thought between what our research looks like and how it impacts our conversations globally, I think would be a great wish. One of my wishes, too, is that I wish that we had unlimited resources. <laughs> a so good that, wish. <laughs> so that we could pay teachers what they really deserve That's in true. order to sit at the table with us. Like, you know, compensate them, you know, more than just $25 an hour or whatever, but like mm -hmm. actual money mm -hmm. so that they are invested in this process with us. I think another big wish is time. I think the, the, the time that it takes to build these relationships is so important that sometimes I feel like there's not enough of it. Um, and so we need to, so you know, can we create more hours in the day to really <laughs> engage with um, our partners and think together? Yeah. That would be a, a hard wish to, to create more than 24 hours in a day. So given that, you know, Closing thought, I would love to open up for kind of closing thoughts from each one. <coughs> Matt? Sure, sure. Well, thank you for having us. Appreciate being here and appreciate spending time with your great work. Um, I would, my closing thought is just a shameless plug for our work and um, the narrative we're trying to get out there in the international space. So again, our website is icerpglobal.com, I-C-E-R-P. <laughs> global.com, and um, we would love for people in the audience to join our, um, our board. I know Jerry and I would love to do it. Jerry's helped design ICERP, and uh, we would like just to promote a global conversation about how we think differently about using research in proactive manners so that it's real-time impacts on pedagogy and teachers thinking about what the, the changing world of education should look like in the future. So thank you for coming.
Yeah, thank you so much for um, having us. I think one of the um, cool takeaways that I'm hoping to do for maybe next year is we could come back and share some of that the would research be great. findings. <laughs> I know this is just the beginning, um, but maybe we can kind of talk about the process in a, a little bit more detail the next mm -hmm. time we come and share what we found. Chris? <coughs> yeah, I, you know, this conference this is the first time I've attended this conference, and I um, love the, pa the unbridled passion that people have for improving education for all students. And it's, it's like my passion as well. Um, and I think that it's been so exciting to hear and I hope that we can infuse really strong um, evidence into that process. Mm -hmm. I've, I've not heard, I, I, don't, there, I don't know how many district and um, school folks are in here, but I know that ESSA is like something on everyone's mind, mm -hmm. and um, ESSA requires that any interventions that are being selected and used for any sort of intervention effort have to fit within a four-tier level of evidence, strong, moderate, promising, or rationale. And to hit that strong level, which is what the interventions that I know, startup innovators, anybody who's building an intervention right now, you want that strong because that's the best level of evidence that somebody's going to select your intervention and that's what they're gonna use. But to have that level, it has to be a random assignment study. Sure. And that's a very difficult bar. And I am surprised to hear more about it, but I think that um, that's why that's my closing thought, right? It's very, it's, it is an important part of the work that we're doing. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would agree with Kristen. I, my closing thought is just, um, if you are in a district or I would push you to find a partner who can help you think about how you're gonna make claims about what you're doing on behalf of your kids and kind of get away from just the more descriptive analysis of, of just what you're doing with those kids, but find a way that you can make big claims because our kids deserve that. We deserve to know if the funds that we're using, if the resources, um, the strategies that we're doing are effective for our kids. So find a partner, find somebody who can be that external third party so that you can walk away feeling really, really confident that what I'm doing is the best uh, intervention for my kids. Right, well, and that's what we all want for all of our children across the country. So I want to ask you all to thank, come join me in thanking our panelists for spending time with us today. Thank you. Thank you.